Jay, it's great to see you again, and thank you so much for kicking off the quantum computing track at this year's 6.5 Summit. Great. Got a lot of people watching. It's really exciting. So, but we're here to talk quantum computing, but in the context of the big picture, we've been talking to a lot of your fellow compatriots about uh, the future of computing, uh, IBM's full-scale approach, but it's time to talk quantum. You're the the last in this series of the future of computing, and let's uh, let's knock it out of the park here. Sounds great. Yeah, Jay was a was a great guest at the summit, and so hopefully we can tie this together a little bit. It is a really big story. This whole full stack approach, and quantum is probably the one that people know the least about. And so, I love maybe starting with that big macro view, Jay, of how. IBM sees quantum sort of fitting into its full, uh, full you know, future of compute and full stack view. Yeah, I think I would, I would take it one step. I think the future of computing is not going to be computing without quantum. Uh, so, if you think what quantum does is it does some math that is really, really hard for classical conventional computers to do. So, if we're going to build a future of computing and it doesn't have quantum you haven't got the future of computing. So it's fundamentally it has to be part of it. Hey, can, and we can just do the mic drop now, right? Exactly. Uh, interview's done. All right. Well, I actually, I actually like something you said off camera though, because you said something about, you know, sort of quantum computing and maybe, you know, using some other vernaculars there, because you're sort of alluding to that already about sort of being part of the story and quantum accelerators and yep. quantum, you know, and I think that's kind of an important point to make early on in this conversation yeah. is that, part of what's going to make it so important and such a big part of this future computing story is when people realize where it really fits in. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like if you think of compute, it's everywhere. We, you check your weather, you're calling a compute, you do anything, it's compute. Computing is in our lives, it's everywhere. What quantum computing, and if I could get rid of the name computing as we discussed off, offline, what quantum really does is it, it adds something new to computing. And that's something new is something we've never been able to use. And there's so many problems that we have trouble identifying, be it in business problems like optimization, chemistry problems, simulating new materials, uh, even going into some of the ideas in finance and math. There's all these really, really hard problems and we have new math. And when we can scale that math, uh, that, that's where it opens up a lot more business. Yeah, there's been a... I think generally people understand that it is the next generation of computing. I really do appreciate the the notion of quantum acceleration, maybe a, a QPU or, or something like that. It makes total sense because when you look at the grand scheme of, people understand accelerators and how to address them. So I, I like that a lot. I might, I might take that and use it in the future. Please um, do. <laughs> so uh, the other thing people generally agree that this is so big that amazing things in the future that we've never even thought of uh, can be solved. But I also get the question, hey, what can we do right now? What kind of tasks and applications can we do right now? Yeah, so we're in this really interesting time. So I would say we've been doing a lot of lab experiments and we put it on the cloud and we got numbers that are really, really great of how many users doing it. But most of them are still studying the noise <laughs> in the devices. If you want to get to do something of business value, we've got to move beyond that. And so what I'm most excited about is I agree that there's this thing called error correction. Everyone talks about it. We've got ideas of error mitigation, but we're charting a path where very soon we'll be able to run these things we call quantum circuits faster than a classical computer can do it. And so we get right at that tipping point of creating a tool that you cannot simulate with a classical computer. So we're doing that, we've charted that, and we've got technical roadmaps. But at the same time, when you create that tool, you've got to start talking to the clients. What problems map to that tool? Right. And so what we actually see with all the clients we work with is we're actually learning, they're learning, we're understanding their use cases, and we're trying to understand how we can take that use case and map it to this new math that we know will have that tool. So what they're doing right now is they're doing exploring, but they're exploring this new type of math that does things like um, uh, it changes machine learning with different types of, uh, we call them kernels, or it allows you to simulate uh, quantum physics 
by emulating it with a quantum computer rather than just using a big HPC computer that comes to an end. But it's doing everything a different way with a different set of math. And so we're at that point, I, I think in the next year, where you're gonna see this breaking out and how you use this tool, I think is the, it's gonna be the exciting thing over the next few years. That is exciting. And you know, we talked in the green room too, uh, kind of the flag plant of, you know, you have to give them the tools that are useful for to get business advantage out of. And we talked about 2023. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I think you did six or seven announcements, IBM, I uh, think I think it was Kookaburra um, that, that was the flag plant. Yeah, so Kookaburra was 2025. Oh, excuse me, I was getting ahead of myself. Yes. But in 2023, you've set the table so an enterprise could actually take your system and, and create something themselves. So maybe in 2025, they might see some value and I'm just, I'm yes. making this up on my own, adding two years. I can do this. I'm an industry analyst. I don't actually have to do this. So yeah, to try and try and try and <laughs> so the one thing that's important is we're thinking long term. So we're building so our roadmap goes beyond, right? We have right. a heron, which is a 123, and we have multiple of them. Then we have cross build, then flamingo, then kookaburra, as you say. Yeah. And so I imagine keep building these up until really, really big systems so we can do more and more. Uh, with it. What's exciting about 2023 for me is, is if we can cross that point of being able to do something we couldn't do classically, and then how we map it to clients, and right. that's going to start. I agree with you, it's going to take a couple of years to turn something into, into real business value, but it's going to, my hope is in 2023, it's not physicists talking about the noise in these systems, it's us trying to understand how business yeah. problems can run on them and the noise is all handled in the software. So I agree in our roadmap, we talked about much more further in the hardware because we want to make bigger, but we also talked about simplifying it and making it easier for people to use. And so when we start to invent these things like uh, when we make quantum serverless, Qiskit runtime, these things that start to abstract away the noise so physicists are not characterizing and you can start to actually use it by sending like, like when you use a classical computer, you don't worry about the voltages. You, exactly. you call a library and that library does the math that classical computers or GPUs are really good at. So it's an important inflection point because that's gonna be a point where I think we can talk much differently. I and mean, it's not about what's your error, like how many papers do you see or how many people talk about error mitigation, error correction. Hopefully all that gets buried and it becomes how are you uh, using you, it? Daniel, you might like that. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the first year of quantum briefings I took were almost entirely about error mitigation, gates, and, and yeah. you know, how well do you keep a qubit, uh, you know. Yeah, and I think most of the people in the room when I was doing it, it was like uh, PhD, PhD, PhD. Yeah. They got to me yeah. not PhD. Yeah. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm super excited. 2023 to me is the flag plant where, um, not, not that it all starts, but, but this notion of enterprises having um, the tool not focusing on error correction, but maybe working on a on a security application. Yep. Maybe working on something like that. So, so classical computing and just computing because we don't normally call it that, except when we talk about quantum, um, tends to be built with a vibrant ecosystem. You've got startups, you've got big players, you've got a lot of collaboration. Uh, quantum's kind of interesting. So you know you've got this full stack story that. IBM's trying to tell. You've got this full stack sort of quantum approach that you and your team are working on on building. How do you balance sort of trying to take the whole problem on from, you know, the hardware, the software, and all the other abstractions that you mentioned, and at the same time create sort of that, that vibrant ecosystem and be inviting? Because that's what's going to make this really practical is when the right applications map to the right customers become readily available to be run on quantum circuits. So <laughs> I agree. I think the first part is we like, yes, I call it classical computing, quantum computing. We've got to start calling it computing. Yeah. And <laughs> when we get that quantum in it, I actually think when we say full stack, like we're talking pretty low in the stack. If you're going to, like you can totally imagine a startup creating a library or a software application that calls computing. So I envision us creating something very similar to like accelerators, NVIDIA and things like that. There is software, it's not just hardware that gets that accelerator to work. We have to create that software because we know our hardware best that gets that to work. 
But if we're going to create this industry you're talking about, that, 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 that software has got to connect to their software. It's got to connect to data. It's got to connect to other clouds. And all of that has to work together. So we see, we see ourselves creating, yes, some verticals all the way up, but really focusing on a compute layer that includes software and hardware interacting very much together. And I think this is what's different about accelerators to CPUs. Like traditionally CPUs is you build, a, you build your, um, your hardware and then someone builds the operating system. When you have an accelerator like, like a GPU, there is software there. Quantum's going to be the same. You got to have that software that gets the most out of that accelerator. And, and that is how you build this full stack. I love that analogy, by the way. The GPU is such a better analogy than the CPU. For it is. And by the way, before that, I mean, there are hundreds of ASICs, yeah, you know, absolutely. through history that have done the same thing. They just didn't get enough of that play. But I think for understanding purposes, I love it. Is This is a, an awesome accelerator uh, to do some, some cool stuff. Yeah. So um, I've been interacting with uh, IBM probably since the mid 90s. Um, IBM Semiconductor and you've developed a lot of IP around semiconductors, but also around high performance uh, computing. I was struck with, at IBM Think, with, with many of your announcements, I'm thinking, I think I've seen this before. I think I've seen something that's similar to that. And then a uh, big company like IBM, I, I'm, you know, I'm wondering, gosh, big company really changing the game versus maybe a smaller company. And, and I'm wondering, is this an advantage uh, for IBM versus maybe a, a startup that doesn't have a whole lot of IP in semiconductors and, and, and HPC? The short answer is yes. <laughs> we, I think I, I think I, leading the witness. I think, right? I, yeah. I, think yes. I led the witness on that one. So, but like, yeah. if you look and you look at the details that go, the reason we've accelerated so much on the packaging and the things that go is we can leverage everything that we've done in semiconductors in the past. We're taking semiconductor physics, superconducting uh, materials and physics, microwave technology, and we're merging that. And so that semiconductor history, we're, 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 we're using it all the time, be it from bump bonds to through substrate vias to all the things that make traditional computing work really well we can, we're leveraging it and putting it in house. And I think this is what gives us an advantage and is why I, I am confident and we're working so hard to win that sort of accelerator uh, space. But I do think there will be startups that will come up with key, key IP right. in the stack that work with us or work you calling those accelerators. But to compete in the accelerator, it's gonna be hard to compete with the rich history of all the semiconductor knowledge right. and all the infrastructure that is needed to build these. Well, and for years, um, IBM was king of the hill in HPC. So how does HPC relate to this? I don't wanna put words in your mouth again, but I, I kind of look at the scaling and, and things like that. How, how does that help? I think it comes back to the, what, what is the future of computing? Is the, is the I, I'm putting this word out and starting to uh, see if it, it sticks of quantum, quantum centric supercomputing. And the idea there is we're gonna think of our accelerators, but then we want our accelerators to work with um, HPC or some more advanced general purpose classical right. computing to be able to do more. So how do we actually start to make workflows that call a HPC and call a quantum accelerator and how do we integrate that tightly? Can we learn from where classical is gone with serverless and on these other technologies to do it? So I think I think the story of future of computing is quantum, HPC, AI, all of these things converging. Yeah, there, there, there's a really strong symbiotic relationship between what you want us to now say classical computing and quantum. Stop, we'll stop there. And um, I think it's important for people to understand that. And so you've done a nice job here sort of doing some of the mapping, talking about how A, you're, you know, the, the R&D and historic uh, intellectual property development of IBM, which by the way, I think often doesn't get enough credit. Um, so I think uh, top, I mean, not that patent counting is the ultimate way to view it, but IBM's been top in the number of patents for, I don't know, like 
yeah. 30 years? That's been a lot of innovation, <laughs> though, in, 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 in transistor technologies yep. and, and IP for semiconductors. But I, I'm also a guy that likes to talk to markets. I like to talk about practical business value. And you kind of started going down that path. But let's fast forward a couple years ahead. So we talked about 2025, 26. What are some of the things that you're advising to the ecosystem of customers that are going to be adopting this financial services, healthcare, chemistry, and of course, academia, but all the places that want to really put quantum to use, kind of what does that next few years look like as they prepare themselves for a quantum future? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of the things that uh, we've tried to do, uh, tried to do differently in, in our IBM quantum team, is how do you create an offering where you can work with a clients that is not research-based. Like traditionally, if it's this type of technology, a lot of them start like, let's get together and research on algorithms. That, that, that we still do and is needed, but what's more important to a lot of clients, they're asking, how does quantum fit into my future? How will quantum, how will we be able to, what use cases will map to it? How will I be able to explain to my customers quantum? How will I be able to play, explain to my internal stakeholders quantum and so we tried to develop uh, a way so we actually brought people from ibm consulting and we made a small team inside ibm quantum we, which we mixed with a few researchers and they're exactly doing this with a lot of clients and why it's so important is you've got to answer all those questions how's quantum going to matter for my business model how's quantum going to matter sorry for my business how's how am i going to communicate that i'm using quantum uh, to my clients on how am I going to get internal stakeholder uh, understanding the value of this. And this is all, it's all a discussion and relationship coming backwards and forwards. And at the same time, we are learning that what use cases matter for these industries. And then our researchers, which are researching these algorithms, they get a bit of guidance of what type of algorithms should we actually be determining the quantum circuits for because we can start to connect those dots. So right now it's about connecting dots, as we said, like our goal is 2023 to have something that's useful and keep scaling beyond, but it takes a while to connect dots. And I agree with you, 25, 26 of when it really starts to matter to business, but it's connecting dots and, and understanding what is the long-term uh, return. And so I think of the future of quantum computing is going to support various different businesses. We've talked about the compute uh, one. It's going to be like an accelerator as well. There will be companies that will have expertise in chemistry. Will they be able to use this compute to come up with a new catalyst and then be able to use that, like compute once, but then use that catalyst in many different places? They really got to get the expertise of how to use that compute. And so are the chemistry companies getting involved to work out the compute, but eventually they will want to be a solution, provide some type of solution or create something. And, and this goes all the way across finance. They may want to consume the compute to redo calculations, or they might want to do some logistics optimization. And then, so they might want to create solutions. So I think we're going to see all this emerge, but right now it's about how do I understand the value of quantum and how can I map it to all my inter my stakeholders. That was one of the most understandable, like, what do I do next? Uh, so first of all, thank you for that. Hope maybe it maybe it's just because I have to hear it two or three times to fully understand it. Um, that's, that's a possibility, but I, I think it's a lot of your ability to, um, you know, put it into sim simpler words. And I think as, as part of what we need in quantum is a simpler, maybe a simpler vernacular. And I, I think naturally we'll get there again, 25, 26, right? Uh, uh, I think it is, I'm super excited about, but Jay, I really appreciate the time. Uh, once again, uh, a, an incredible discussion uh, about quantum. I learned, uh, I learned a lot, which I guess that's a good thing, right? Or good thing or bad thing. I didn't study the notes uh, up front well enough, but I just want to thank you uh, very much and for closing out uh, our uh, discussion of the future of computing and what IBM's doing about it. Thank you very much. Thanks.